there is a July 13th, 2011 Village Voice article called Scientology's Spy Program, Anatomy of a Covert Operation that starts to detail the extensive training and sabotage that takes place within their in-house spy operation against enemies and uh, potential enemies of the church. Uh, it links to other articles that further elaborate on the topic, and it's just the beginning of uh, anybody who might be interested uh, journey into the world of uh, not only Scientology spying, but surveillance capitalism, um, which is a huge industry and not always above board and not always in line with um, personal civil rights. So uh, I've read a number of articles uh, and books about this topic, uh, and um, one of the things that I've read that Scientology uh, does in the extensive training for its in-house spies, uh, I think even when they hire an outside private investigator, they have them take Scientology uh, spy courses. <clears throat> so. I don't, they don't say Scientology spy course on the front of the book, probably is my guess, but it's the, the, um, the department I think is called the Office of Special Affairs, and within that department, one of the divisions basically spies on people, uh, from what I've read by people outside of the church uh, who are against this practice. Uh, so one of the things that they do in their training is apparently uh, from the reading I've done, they have their um, students study the art of war uh, by Sun Tzu, which is an ancient, uh, still uh, ubiquitous text about, about warfare and it's considered applicable to all forms of uh, warfare and competition. It's a popular book among um, corporate circles looking to improve their game. It is a very, I mean, it is a very uh, great classic text. Uh, it's hard to find a good translation of it, and a lot, I'm sure, is lost in nuance and translation and historical context, but it still remains one of those top books to read if you're looking to sharpen your um, competitive tactics in in any field, it doesn't have to be warfare. You don't have to take it literally, um, but it's one of those books that people read. You know, if they read like the Forty Eight Laws of Power or uh, How to Win Friends, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, you know, one of, it's one of those top kind of self, uh, professional self-improvement books, um, even though it's also an ancient uh, <laughs> text about warfare. So that being said, that's the setup for this very brief story I'm about to tell. Um, this is just going to be like 10 or 15 minutes. But in uh, June of 2022, I was uh, visiting uh, my mother in the city where I'm from for like a day. Um, it's a two hour bus ride away. And I go to the, uh, I go uh, on the mega bus to uh, 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. And uh, then from 30th Street Station, I get on the, um, the, the regional rail to, to ride the few stops from 30th Street Station in the city to where my mother lives, um, just uh, in a suburb close by outside. So I uh, 
catch the last train of the night. Uh, it's maybe like 11 something at night. Um, and there's just like six or seven of us on the train, passengers. The strange thing, and I take this train frequently, I grew up in Philly and when my parents lost their house, they started renting an apartment in the nearby suburbs where they've lived for like over 10 years at this point, take this train all the time. Uh, the This was also peak mask wearing in public settings and um, the the train like ticket taker and announcement they weren't announcing the stops when we were passing each stop and it was it was so uh, dark outside the signs were unreadable for what stop we we were passing uh, and uh, as uh, you know I had maybe six or seven stops from 30th Street station as we passed if we stopped at each stop, I was like, I can't read the signs. Um, can you tell me? I'm. Can you tell me like what what stop we're at? And they're like, Where are you getting off? And I'm like, I'm getting off at Lansdowne. And we're all wearing masks, so it's kind of hard to hear like the articulation of of the words. Um, and uh, and they're like, Oh, okay, I'll announce it, but. As we keep stopping at every stop, they, they are not announcing the stop. And um, I, I, I'm getting nervous. I'm like, oh, um, wait, what stop is that? And they're like, they're like, I'll announce it. Uh, they're like, I'm announcing it. And the intercom is not announcing the stops. Like, usually it, it does. And especially when it's pitch pitch black outside and it's hard to hear people because of masks and it's the last stop of the night like normally that would prompt uh, extra uh, taking extra care in announcing the stops um, and so uh, like we stop at uh, a stop right after mine called Gladstone um, and that sounds somewhat like Lansdowne and um, I was like we just passed my stop and they're like this is Gladstone and I was like I was like no no I said I was getting off at Lansdowne and and the intercom that didn't, nobody, you said you would announce the stops, but nobody announced it. And, and then he was like, oh, the intercom must have been broken. And uh, I was not, I was definitely upset, but of course I don't behave in a rude manner when I get upset, especially because I know I'm getting targeted by black ops that's designed to make me like, true, like have some public freak out and then use it as an excuse to further falsely incriminate me. Um, so I'm like, you know, okay, this is the last stop of the night. And this is the last train of the night. I have no way to get back. <laughs> like, I was like, do you think I could get a refund for the ticket? And they were like, we can't give you any kind of voucher. I was like, okay, well, I'm, I missed my stop. The announcement wasn't playing. I was trying to tell you that. And now I'm going to get off at a stop that's not mine in the middle of the night and you don't really know if I have any way of finding my way back until 7 in the morning when the next train comes. So just letting you know that and it was like, okay, the intercom was broken. I don't know if the conductors were intentionally sabbing the intercom, sabotaging the intercom themselves or Scientology was able to remotely do it. Um, then again, many of these fiascos that are staged against me are designed to be so subtle that you really you really can't say, oh, that was on purpose because it could have just been an accident. 
it's very expertly designed to appear that way a lot of the time. I have had some blatant attacks that cannot in any way be portrayed as an accident, no matter how hard you try, but many of these things that happen to me always seem like they could have just been an accident. The only thing that indicates that they're definitely not is the frequency with which they occur. Um, and of course my increasingly expertly trained eye at sussing these things out. Um, but I always have to say, oh, it could have been an accident because there's nothing I have to hold on to. I don't have evidence. I don't have an investigation team able to look at this from the back end. So I always have to be like, oh, okay, like just pretend, you know, I have to just be polite and go along with it until I have something more um, concrete to, you know, pinpoint. Otherwise, it, they'll just make me look like an asshole. Um, so, uh, but here's the thing that really drives home that this is like an, like a mafiosa style operation that happened to me. Um, I get off this train, you know, it's the la it's the last, uh, yeah, I just get off the train in the dark. It's a relatively residential you know, tree-lined suburban area, but Philly is the kind of place where it's like, there's, it's not, it's like, like a couple months ago, there was like a murderer wandering the suburban wooded area of Philly and the schools had to close down. So it's very, you know, it's not like just the, it's not like a quiet countryside where nothing ever happens, uh, nothing bad ever happens. So, you know, uh, and because I'm being stalked by a black ops, I'm like, oh, maybe this is the night they're gonna, like, kill me and make it look like an accident. Uh, so anyway, I get off the train, a guy gets off behind me, and he's like, oh, do you want me to tell you how to get to Lansdowne? And I was like, I'm okay, I'll just get a ride, because I don't know who he is, I don't know if he was hired to follow me on the train, and I don't know if, you know, his job was to just give me directions that would just further confuse me and leave me walking down a dark road in the middle of the night. Uh, so I stay where I am. It's kind of like a parking lot in a, in a woodsy suburban area with like a large apartment complex over down uh, at the end of a steep hill. So it's not like panic. The only, the only disconcerting thing is that it's completely secluded. There's no people around. Um, and, uh, so I go to my phone uh, to, you know, see if I can get a cab or a Lyft or an Uber, uh, and the screen is totally frozen. Like, I can't activate the touch. I can't swipe. I can't do anything. It won't, it won't receive, uh, like, touch screen interaction. It won't react at all. It's just frozen. And uh, I can't turn it off. The only thing when I pressed the side when I pressed the side buttons, uh, it would go into that thing that iPhones do where it's an emergency mode and you can swipe for SOS. I've never done that, and I wasn't about to do it there because I wasn't in a real emergency. I was like, I would save that for if I saw somebody coming out of the woods with like an axe or something, but I wasn't gonna just do it because, uh, for all I know, there could have been like cops on Scientology's payroll staged nearby to intercept my signal. I don't know if that's possible, but then they could show up and be like, oh, this crazy woman in the woods called SOS because the train took her one stop past her usual stop. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't going to help. I was going to save the SOS for truly near death. Um, so my phone is frozen and I can't turn it off to restart it. So I'm like, okay. I was like, okay, I could die tonight, but let's explore the other options. I look over the hill, there's an apartment complex, it's very big. I'm like, is there a receptionist? Is there a night, is there a night uh, door person or a guard of some kind? Maybe they would let me use their phone. Um, I was like, oh wow, that's a long walk down over that hill. Uh, and then uh, I, then I'm like, okay, when does the next train come? Oh, 7 a.m. I was like, could I hang out in a train station parking lot for seven hours overnight uh, 
sleep deprived and wait for the train, I was like, no, that will go terribly wrong and I will feel just physically awful uh, within a few hours uh, and probably trying to fight falling asleep uh, in public in the parking lot. Uh, I notice across the train station tracks, there's a cubic brick uh, shelter, like open, open air brick cubic shelter, you know, with a bench inside to wait for the train. It's like just the only thing like on the on the on the pavement uh platform like almost just glowing and disembodied and floating in the in the otherwise dark night um and i uh, i walk over to it it's almost like a apparition from a david lynch film or something um but David Lynch's Transcendental Meditation, not Scientology. So I go to this brick structure. It's like totally empty, totally clean, totally open air. It's like almost like a the size of a super, super tiny house. I'm like, oh, this is nice. I'm like looking at it. I'm like, could I sit here for seven hours? I'm like, definitely not. Like, clearly not. I will fall asleep. And then... I will be just too vulnerable um, uh, because of the circumstances I'm in. Anyone would be vulnerable doing that. But I'm like, Joyce, that would just be stupid. But, you know, I'm getting hunted by a black ops, so I tend to be put in more circumstances that create desperation, and they're designed to do that. Uh, so I see... There's nothing in this cubic brick structure, right? Nothing at all. Not a bag, not a signpost, not a trash can, not an empty soda bottle. It's perfectly pristine. And it's like glowing in the lamplight. It's like a David Hopper painting or something. That's his name, David Hopper, the guy who painted the, the diner. Uh, it's like that, except on the ledge of this brick train shelter is a hard copy used uh, book with no dust cover. Um, it's like kind of somewhat refined old book, right? And the title of the book I see as I get close to it is American Trader by Brad Taylor, right? I'm like, a Scientology operative left this here to make me feel like I'm just a traitor or something. And I'm like, or just could be coincidence. You know, the, psycho the psychological warfare I experience on a daily basis could always just be coincidence. So I open the book, right? I'm like, oh, maybe I could just... I could read this all night, which I knew I knew is just not a rational thought. I would surely fall asleep and, you know. So I look inside and on the fr front pages, there's, uh, there's an, an, a quote from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Uh, the quote was, all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. But then, I also remembered another lesson from The Art of War. which I have read somewhat. And one of the instructive anecdotes Sun Tzu uses in The Art of War is the story about, like, uh, there's a, you know, there's two war, there's two competing armies who are at war. 
and like basically the leader of one army plants like this shiny inscription on some like monument uh, for the leader of the competing army to notice um, so that he will bend down to read it and as he's distracted reading it the other army comes and attacks and I was like oh well that that that's what this could be they're planting a book here and I'm bending down reading it and soon I may be I'm literally being placed in a position where I'm like gonna be a sitting duck and somebody's gonna come for me and uh, you know In retrospect, I'm like, oh, shoot, what if that was for a, an FBI sting? Like, and what if the, what if the whole thing was I was going to be bait so that the person doing it could get caught? Well, if you want me to participate in a sting, you need to get my consent directly, and you need to not engage in activities designed to destroy my acting career and sabotage my book deal. So... Whether that was purely Scientology or some attempt to maneuver me into a sting, miscommunications took place. I, uh, you know, yeah, if you start to wonder whether or not you're indirectly being invited to participate in a mission, definitely step back and reconsider that because that's not a good thing and that's not something you should pursue. If you're going to be involved in a sting, they need to get your direct consent and there need to be forms signed. Anyway, I don't, I don't think that's, that's what was happening. Um, it was either purely Scientology or it was like the FBI maybe trying to get me to do something crazy to discredit me because, you know, I've challenged, you know, multiple interests in an intelligent way, which is just innately a threat in this society, unfortunately, at this time. So, I, uh, my phone eventually unfroze, and I, uh, I got in touch with my 76-year-old mother, uh, who I'm terrified to drive with, uh, and who may or, you know, sometimes we get along, sometimes not, uh, and who doesn't really have a concept of me as an adult, much less as, like, as me, of me as an adult, and then anything beyond that is incomprehensible to her as well. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so I did that, and, you know, I was like, oh, maybe they're gonna, like, plant something in my mom's t tire and, you know, get her car to crash, uh, but that didn't happen, fortunately. Uh, she managed to pick me up, and I got home safe and alive, and thankfully went to sleep. Uh, so, that happened.